Hello and uh, welcome to another OpenShift Commons briefing. I'm Diane Mueller, the Director of Community Development for OpenShift, and I'm really pleased to have with us today Joe Fernandez um, and Mike McGrath to give us an update on the roadmap for both OpenShift and Atomic, as uh, Atomic is upstream into OpenShift. It's a very integral part of our project. So um, I'm going to let Joe kick it off. And I think Mike is going to come in about halfway through. And we'll have Q&A at the end. Um, or you can post things in the chat. We'll have a conversation after. And you can ask all of your questions then. All right. Thank you very much. And here you go. Joe, take it away. Great. Thanks, Diane. So as Diane mentioned, uh, my name is Joe Fernandes. And um, I lead product management uh, for OpenShift. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, OpenShift and Atomic. And I'll start with like. Uh, kind of an explanation of how they relate to one another and, and um, both upstream and commercially. Um, and then um, talk about sort of uh, where we're at from a roadmap perspective and where we're going uh, in this upcoming year. Hopefully give you some insight into um, some of the uh, things uh, we're working on in the community and also uh, things that we're getting asked about by our users. Um, so, um, so all OpenShift and Atomic are part of Red Hat's container solutions, right? And so this slide kind of just um, covers that really, you know, types of things we're focused on is how to help customers leverage containers and, and container-based platforms to modernize application delivery, um, uh, bring greater agility to both uh, traditional applications as well as uh, newer cloud-native apps, um, drive consistency through the life cycle from, from the dev and test environments all the way out to production, um, and then ultimately deploy those applications anywhere where they want to run. So, you know, we talk about hybrid, hybrid as being sort of the, the predominant architecture. And for us, hybrid could mean, um, uh, you know, public cloud and private cloud. It could mean public, uh, multiple public cloud services. It could be mean, you know, uh, you know, virtualization or even bare metal. We want to be able to, to run across whatever infrastructure uh, or whatever combination of infrastructures customers want to um, deploy their applications on. Um, so, so starting with Atomic, really, um, Atomic started out as Atomic Host, and Mike's going to um, talk a, a little bit about what we're doing there. Um, but, um, but Atomic Host um, is a, is a variant of our Linux uh, uh, family, right? Red, of Red Hat Enterprise Linux. It's a. It's really optimized for running uh, containers. Um, so, um, so both Red Hat Enterprise Linux and Red Hat Enterprise Linux Atomic Host, which are the container, uh, which are the the Linux offerings that that we provide, both of them now can can run uh, do Docker based uh, containers, right? So our container runtime and packaging that we standardize is the Docker container runtime and packaging format. Um, but you know. You need more than just containers and Linux to build out an enterprise container infrastructure. So, um, so as we've talked about in prior calls, um, beyond these uh, two foundational pieces, you also have the need to orchestrate uh, containers across multiple hosts uh, and to manage uh, that cluster. And for that, we do work in Kubernetes uh, and basically bring that in uh, to uh, to manage uh, to manage those container resources across the cluster. Um, but even that is not sufficient, right? Because when you're running containers on a cluster and you're dealing with, um, um, you know, uh, containers each having their own IP addresses, you need to be able to manage the networking uh, of those containers uh, across the various hosts. You also need to manage things like storage. If you want to run stateful services in containers, you need to store those uh, container images in a registry. Um, you may be interested in you know different telemetry like logs and metrics and to gather info on how containers are working. And you need to sort of manage um, the security of the containers and the applications that run inside. So all of these are, are challenges that um, that customers face when they're thinking about moving beyond just Docker on the desktop uh, and thinking about Docker in the data center, right? Containerized uh, uh, data center infrastructure that can run, be used to run enterprise applications. And so we bring that all together uh, under the Atomic brand. Um, so upstream, um, that's um, Project Atomic, as well as uh, pr uh, projects under that umbrella that we work on, things like uh, Docker in the Docker community, Kubernetes, 
um, for telemetry. We do work uh, uh, in the elk community in, in Elasticsearch and Kibana, which are now part of um, part of the solution. Uh, we also, uh, on the networking side, we leverage Open vSwitch. Um, and so, so all of these things sort of um, are are part of the that container infrastructure. And then commercially, we announced in September a public preview of something called the Red Hat Atomic Platform. So the Red Hat Atomic Platform is uh, the packaging of the components that you see here um, that we will um, soon be offering as sort of a, a standalone commercial uh, subscription uh, that you can get from Red Hat. Um, OpenShift then kind of takes all of those, that entire infrastructure and then uh, adds um, uh, you know, additional functionality uh, to build out a full container application platform. So this includes things like um, self-service capabilities for, uh, for your end users. So if you've ever seen on prior calls, demonstrations of OpenShift, um, whether it was through the web console or command line interface or the work we're doing on Eclipse tooling, um, these are all part of the self-service uh, interface that we um, that we built on top of this infrastructure. Uh, we also then build out different uh, options for middleware and data services um, and publish them through a service catalog so that uh, developers can consume those services. And, um, and we'll be talking about kind of where we're going with service catalogs to actually um, allow them to consume other services. Um, and then ultimately, uh, it's about how, how do you manage the applications through the lifecycle, right? So when you're running applications in containers, um, every time you change the application, you're not making the change in the container, you're actually changing the image, the Docker image that generated that container, and then instantiating a new uh, instance from the image. So being able to uh, build new images efficiently, uh, being able to manage uh, updates, uh, to, to those images when you need to update the application or, or um, deploy new code, and then being able to manage the deployments across the lifecycle, uh, as I mentioned, from dev to test to production. Those are some of the things that OpenShift um, adds um, that uh, uh, beyond sort of the, the atomic infrastructure to provide you an end-to-end -end platform. So, um, so there's even more still, right? So, um, so uh, beyond the platform that you see there in the center, we're also working on a set of developer uh, tooling, and I, I know there was a previous commons briefing, I believe, um, maybe before the break, where we, we talked about uh, things like CDK, our container development kit, uh, which is basically um, a tool that allows uh, developers to run containers on their local machine and then uh, um, upload them to uh, to OpenShift or Atomic, and then uh, and that's going to feed into a, a full development studio that ties the container development kit into other dev tools like IDEs and so forth. Um, and then on the management side, we, you know, we tie these things into Red Hat's various management solutions, whether it's CloudForms, uh, which is our hybrid cloud management solution, um, Ansible, which Red Hat recently acquired uh, for, uh, for configuration uh, management and automation, and, and then Red Hat Satellite. Um, so kind of all of these things combined um, you know, bring this together. And then on the infrastructure side, obviously, um, OpenStack and Red Hat virtualization and um, uh, are, are options that, that, that basically you can run this on as well as running it on uh, any of our certified public cloud providers. Um, so again, the, the, the work we're doing now in containers really touches um, all of the products in the Red Hat portfolio. So while we um, really drive the roadmap for the stuff in the center, um, we also work closely with our uh, our team who works on our management solutions, our development solutions, and on other infrastructure solutions like OpenStack, like storage, uh, like KVM, and so forth, to make sure we have sort of a consistent and well-integrated platform uh, across the board. So in terms of our roadmap, this is just a high-level picture, right? So, um, so you know, our journey really um, on this new platform um, we started in uh, June uh, of last year when we released OpenShift 3, uh, and, uh, and that was sort of the culmination of uh, nearly two years worth of work to sort of rebuild the OpenShift platform on this new Docker and Kubernetes uh, base, uh, as well as on RHEL 7 um, and the new Atomic host. Um, and then in the fall, um, we uh, put out our first point release of OpenShift Enterprise, and also put out the Atomic Enterprise uh, Platform public preview. Um, so 
So with each release now, you'll just see a number of features and enhancements. But if you're downloading um, either OpenShift Enterprise or uh, the Atomic Enterprise platform today, or you're pulling the latest uh, community bits from Origin, um, you'll see um, features that were introduced in the fall, uh, whether it's features around auto scaling or uh, enhancements to, uh, on the UX side, um, new middleware services um, that are now available, um, the Elk stack integration uh, that we added for logging, um, enhancements in storage and networking. So quite a lot went into that point release. Um, and that's just, um, you know, now we're on to the next, right? So in the bottom right, what I'll focus on today is just um, a few of the things that we're working on in the first half of this year. Um, so, um, so for those of you who've um, kind of worked with us upstream, you know that um, we, we do development on, a, on an agile uh, uh, scrum-based uh, model. Um, but you know, we, we typically plan on, on half-year cycles, right? So, so while the, the, the development happens scrum to scrum, we, you know, we know as we sit here today that there will be a 3.2 release um, targeted for early this spring, and then uh, uh, another point release 3.3, which will come out right around Red Hat Summit or, or shortly after, uh, and that's uh, this year, that's uh, end of June. Um, so, so around end of June or July, you'll, you'll see a 3.3. So we kind of plan them both together, and the features there um, kind of represent um, stuff that's going into each of those releases. Obviously, the, the things that take um, longer will uh, will end up in 3.3, things that we can get out sooner will be in the 3.2 release. Um, so we don't only think in terms of um, release versions and timeframes, we think in terms of themes. Um, so these are some of the themes that are driving the work we're doing in the first half of this year. Uh, one of the biggest things that we're doing is uh, so bringing our last solution to the V3 platform, which is OpenShift Online. So commercially, you can get OpenShift in three ways. You can get it as a software solution, which is OpenShift Enterprise, and that was that's been on the three platforms since last June. Uh, current version is three three point one. Um, OpenShift Dedicated is our second offering. This is a public cloud service that Red Hat runs. That's basically single tenant, which means each customer gets their own OpenShift cluster, their own dedicated instance of OpenShift um, for just running their applications. And then OpenShift Online uh, is our multi-tenant, um, you know, uh, public cloud service. Uh, and you know, this is some of you guys may have worked with this at OpenShift.com. Uh, currently, that's still on our V2 architecture, but we've been working hard uh, to to get that onto the new V3 platform. So, so developers who are consuming OpenShift in the public cloud uh, can get the latest and greatest uh, capabilities that we're uh, we're providing on premise and in the dedicated offering. Um, and then you know, uh, the other bullets here represent different areas that we're working in. I've included um, tags and parentheses. So if you if you follow our Trello boards, you'll see that we have a roadmap board where we sort of outline some of these themes or, or epics. Um, and then through tags, um, like, uh, like what you see here, they'll link out to user stories on the team boards. Right now there's, uh, as part of Red Hat's overall engineering effort, there's, I believe, uh, 15 scrum teams, uh, 14 or 15 scrum teams uh, working on OpenShift and Atomic, and they're each working in their respective areas. But a lot of these features um, span multiple teams, right? So, um, so through this tagging mechanism, um, if you're trying to follow development in Trello, you can start from one of these themes and then drill down into the various uh, user stories and uh, engineering work that, that goes on. So certainly we're continuing to drive our developer um, experience um, you know, through, uh, for OpenShift itself. Uh, we're working on uh, we're, our build and deployment capabilities tying into uh, 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 continuous integration uh, and, and working towards a continuous deployment model on OpenShift itself. Um, at the Kubernetes and Atomic layer, we're working on something called service linking, which I'll cover in a second. And, and that leads into sort of being able to publish out catalogs of services for users to consume. Uh, we're adding uh, Red Hat Mobile as a new set of services for OpenShift users, and then exp uh, expanding into additional products in the JBoss middleware portfolio. Um, 
We're working on uh, our integrated registry um, to add more enterprise uh, uh, registry capabilities. Um, I'll get into that, and then Mike can um, can elaborate on that as well. Uh, continue to work on um, uh, scale, right? Larger size deployments, uh, more nodes, more users, uh, more instances, and so forth. So, uh, so doing quite a fair amount of performance tuning and scale testing and so forth um, uh, on the platform on, and on components like Kubernetes. Uh, various efforts around container security, which is really um, both in Kubernetes and, and upstream in the Docker community. Um, and getting into uh, how to automate the provisioning of clusters, so uh, multi, uh, multi-node deployments and so forth. Um, and then the overall install and getting started experience and so forth. So um, this isn't um, a complete list. I think there's a couple of things I missed, but kind of shows you some of the uh, you know bigger areas where you'll see work underway. Um, so um, so I won't be able to cover everything here, but I'm going to give you some of the highlights um, in terms of the user interface uh, enhancements. So we continue doing point work um, on the OpenShift web console to allow you to do more things through our browser UI, right? So ultimately our goal is that everything that you can do through our API and through our command line interface, you should also be able to do through our web UI. Um, and, um, and so this is just the next set of things, whether it's being able to, um, uh, to uh, specify uh, resource constraints on your pods, uh, delete entities like po projects and pods and so forth, um, add a, a routes uh, to a service, uh, display and attach uh, storage volumes, uh, view, uh, view more metrics this time on, on uh, build uh, uh, times and so forth. Um, these are all things that, that you'll see and I've kind of marked, um, a couple of them actually got into uh, uh, a Zstream release we're putting out this month, which is 311. Um, Many of them will be in 3.2, which is um, spring time frame, I'll say March slash April, because so that way development doesn't <laughs> get mad at me for, for giving a specific date, but probably uh, talking late March uh, to early April on the 3.2 time frame. And then 3.3 uh, then three, three would be sort of late June to July uh, time frame. Uh, um, and we'll have more specific dates as we go along. Um, the other thing is uh, kind of introducing um, new UI. So, um, so deployment cut pipelines is a concept that we've been talking about for a bit, but this is the ability to, um, through the UI, visualize uh, your applications from the standpoint of the stage of the life cycle that they're in. Uh, so, so uh, you know, um, if your applications are running uh, in a development environment and then you promote them to test or you promote them to, uh, to UAT or prod, being able to map applications to environments and then um, and then watch uh, the deployment across various stages. That's something that we've been uh, doing a lot of thinking about and are bringing not only to the UX, but to uh, uh, to all the underlying supporting infrastructure. Um, service linking um, has to do with making it easier to attach one service to another service. So as an example, if I'm uh, uh, in OpenShift and I create a Node.js application, um, and you know you can you can start that up, you can scale up additional instances, then you want to attach it to say um, a database, a MySQL. Um, that you can do that today. Um, it's just uh, it's not as easy as it could be, right? If you don't have a template predefined to make those connections, um, yeah, there's a, a bit of manual work to to sort of have uh, have one service talk to another service, and we just want to make that as simple as you know uh, you know add add a service to to, to Node.js or attach a service. So the concept of service linking, whether you're inside of a project, uh, whether you're working across projects, this is a common use case. Uh, maybe I'm a front end developer uh, working on uh, UI, but I need to consume some back end services that someone else is building and they're working in a different OpenShift project or Kubernetes namespace, I want to be able to, to add those back-end services to my, um, to my front-end service. Um, that's another use case for this. And then linking to services outside of, of OpenShift. So if, if I want to attach to a database 
somewhere else in my data center or a service that I'm consuming in the public cloud. Um, these are all things that you can do today. Um, it's not that you, you can't do them, it's just making that easier. And then from service linking, that you get into sort of being able to um, predefine those links um, and, and be able to publish them through a, a service catalog, which is sort of where this goes next. And then from, from service catalogs, you get into being able to do billing and metering in terms of a marketplace. Um, so this is sort of a, a, a step on that. And I know Diane's been working on uh, an upcoming commons briefing just to talk about this particular feature because it, there's been a lot of interest um, among our customer base and in the community around what we're doing here. Um, YAML editor is just a, a, you know, when you do have to default to editing a big build config or a deployment config, um, uh, you know, this, this is something that we added uh, uh, or adding to the UX so that you can do that, uh, some of those config changes through the browser versus having to go, uh, go outside. Um, so beyond just sort of like the front end developer experience, and, and by the way, this, this corresponding work on the command line uh, interface uh, as well on the underlying API. So for example, on auto scaling, um, we added auto scaling uh, support um, um, in in three uh, in three one. Uh, we're enhancing that in in uh, three two to to be able to scale on additional metrics. But being able to configure that through the web console is um, is also uh, work that's targeted here, uh, particularly for the June release. Um, so build automation. Um, so as I mentioned, when you deploy an application in a container. Um, you know, at some point that application is going to need to change, right? You're going to need to um, add more code. You're going to need to modify the config. You might need to patch the base runtime. And, uh, and, and for any of those changes, what you want to do is actually not modify the running container, but actually build a new image, right? So essentially um, Docker build at the lowest level, but you want to build a new image that has those changes and deploy new instances out to, uh, to your um, to your cluster um, to uh, to uh, reflect that change. Um, there's different ways that you can do builds. Um, so um, in the initial release of OpenShift three, uh, we had a mechanism called source to image, or we still have a mechanism called source to image or S two I, uh, that allows you to do a build uh, from source. So you you provide um, source code and we uh, or you push your source code to a Git repository and either manually or, or automatically a build will be triggered that takes your source code and then does um, the application build as well as the uh, image build, the Docker image build. So for example, if you're pushing Java code to get, um, we would do, we do the Maven build and pull all the dependencies and then, uh, and then uh, uh, take those Java binaries and then put them into a Docker image, right? Do a Docker build. So there's really two parts to that build. There's the, the application build, and then there's the, the image build. Well, in the case of Java specifically, what if you already have binaries created? What if you already have um, war files or jar files from your existing build systems, uh, from your existing uh, CI? Um, what happens next? Well, you, know, you still need to get those binaries into a container to run them. So at that point, you have the first half solved but not the second half. So we've um, we've uh, inter you know had this concept of being able to build from a binary, and that's something that we're enhancing, right? So so kind of the the, orig the original mechanism in 3.0, you still had to go through Git, so you'd push those binaries to Git the way you push source, and we can build them from there. In 3.1, we introduced um, a command that allowed you to push uh, the binary via CLI, so you could. You could bypass Git and just start a build from a, a specified uh, file or directory that you pass us. Um, and then uh, we're working on uh, uh, pull-based mechanisms, uh, improving the documentation, the functionality around um, building from binaries that, that you, you uh, send us, uh, uh, that you specify for us via your Docker file or assembly script. So that's a, a big area, um, as well as then tying that all through your CI um, uh, system. Uh, we have a Jenkins image uh, for folks who are using Jenkins, but we want to actually ultimately work with whatever CI 
systems customers may already have in place. Um, so you'll see other things here, but this is probably one of the, the big areas for our developer uh, experience team is to sort of uh, continue pushing forward on build automation and CI integration. Um, and then from there, uh, get into the CI CD from continuous integration into continuous deployment. And this is sort of the deployment pipelines work that I mentioned. So we wanna be able to visualize um, a pipeline. Uh, so in the near term, we're working on UX to visualize a pipeline and different stages within a pipeline, um, be able to interface that at least through Jenkins um, so that you can sort of tie um, tie that pipeline to uh, to our Jenkins uh, uh, builders and then um, and then uh, use that to, to promote um, longer term we're, uh, we're actually kind of continuing to build on that to, to do more complex workflows right so basically be able to to, to do more um, uh, more elaborate pipelines and and, uh, and be able to trigger like automated promotion uh, via different actions. Um, we're adding more middleware and mobile services. Uh, I'm going to try to move along because just realized we're running a little bit behind. Um, we want to add more uh, middleware and mobile services. So as I mentioned, the Red Hat mobile application platform is a, uh, uh, a Red Hat commercial product that's based on Feed Henry, which was a company we acquired um, more than a year ago now, uh, which now forms the basis for our mobile solutions. There's a new version of JBoss EAP, which is our uh, enterprise application platform, the commercial JBoss app server. So EAP7 is coming out this year, and that'll be available in OpenShift. BPM is the uh, Red Hat JBoss uh, business process management suite, uh, which will be integrated um, this year. And then API Man and Keycloak, these are both open source projects. Uh, right now, uh, we're not selling them commercially, but, but they're actually going to become uh, products in the areas of API management, and then Keycloak is a uh, is a single sign-on uh, authentication uh, solution um, that will be um, uh, Red Hat will be productizing, and, and those will both be services on OpenShift this year. Um, dropping down into the infrastructure layer, um, I mentioned enterprise registry capabilities. So at the atomic layer, OpenShift and uh, the atomic platform include an integrated uh, Docker registry. So this is a standard Docker V2 registry. That's where all the images live. Um, and that's where we store new images that we build um, when you're working uh, in either of those products. Um, so we're, we're gonna continue enhancing uh, th th those that registry. But what we're doing is adding features to allow you to, administrators to better manage images in the registry. So there's a, a user interface that will allow you to actually inspect and 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 see what images you have, um, and then at, we're adding administration capabilities around allowing ad administrators to control access, uh, import new images into the registry, and ultimately we'd like this to be something that you could use on its own. So if if all if all you're looking for from from Red Hat is a, is a standalone registry to better control the work that your developers are doing, you should be able to do that. And then ultimately from there, you can uh, uh, expand into the full uh, set of functionality that uh, that OpenShift provides, Atomic provides, because those are the that'll be the same the same registry. So so um, so yeah, um, continuing to do work on storage. Um, uh, so storage is basically how how we how do we mount um, volumes from a storage cluster to containers that need them? So if you're running a database, like I mentioned, MySQL or Postgres, if you're running a database uh, in a container, for example, you don't want to store your data in that container because the container is ephemeral. Um, so we use Kubernetes storage volumes to mount uh, storage from a storage cluster into those containers. Some of the things that we're working on, <coughs> excuse me, uh, in this first half of this year is things like dynamic provisioning of persistent storage volumes. So um, for uh, storage solutions that support dynamic provisioning, you could actually create those storage volumes on the fly um, as developers request them. So e uh, AWS, uh, 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 Google, and, and um, uh, OpenStack um, are, are three that support that. Um, 
And then we're getting into things like uh, being able to define storage tiers uh, via labels so that you can have different classes of storage and then, um, and then make those available to different users. Uh, maybe a lower class of storage for dev environments, maybe a higher class of storage options for production environments, let's say. Um, and then we're adding more storage plugins. So, so we added a number of plugins in the last release. So, so we, are, we now have options for things like NFS and Gluster and Ceph and iSCSI and Fiber Channel and Amazon and Google and uh, Cinder. Um, uh, Azure is uh, the next um, um, public cloud storage option that we're adding. And then we're enhancing uh, for specific storage solutions like uh, NetApp and EMC, kind of enhancing um, the existing uh, plugins that you would use to tie into those to do more, uh, more specific things like dynamic provisioning or others, uh, other um, uh, you know, uh, provider specific uh, features. Um, continuing to do work upstream in the Docker community, right? So all the containers work we do is actually not in Atomic or Origin, or, or most, most of it is actually in, in the Docker community itself. There's a major new release of Docker uh, 110 that's, um, that's coming out imminently, and we'll be um, integrating that into the latest releases of OpenShift and Atomic. Um, user namespaces is something that came out in the fall. Um, it's in experimental, so it's not, it's not full production yet in Docker, but it's in the Docker experimental channel. But this is the ability to take um, uh, containers, uh, take processes and containers, uh, make them, uh, uh, allow them to run as root, but then map them to non-root users um, on the host. So that basically uh, you can allow processes to run that require root privilege without compromising uh, the host, without risking the host uh, by, by allowing that process to have root uh, on the underlying host. So, so still a bit of work to do there. I think there was a major step forward here last year, but still a bit of work to continue polishing that in Docker as well as in um, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, the, the corresponding um, capabilities at the operating system uh, to leverage it. Um, image scanning, the ability to scan images. Uh, this is basically something that we've been working on, a feature called Atomic Scan that's integrated with SCAP. Um, we'll, we'll be productizing that this year. Um, we're working on optimizing uh, the size of our base images uh, for RHEL. So the RHEL, RHEL 7 and RHEL 6 base images around which many of our Red Hat containers are built. Um, uh, you know, we're, we're working on, on that as well as things like SE Linux support uh, for overlay FS um, and then more work upstream that's ongoing around image signing uh, and notary. Uh, Kubernetes, um, I already mentioned the auto scaling and service linking. Pod idling is another feature. Uh, this basically is um, something that we had in OpenShift and V2 um, that we're bringing uh, to V3, which allows you to essentially um, take a container that's not, not being actively used, it's not being accessed or modified, and then idle it so that um, essentially you free up the resource to run other containers. So we're driving that capability upstream in the Kubernetes community, and it's something that uh, I think we're looking forward to bringing into the OpenShift and Atomic um, offerings. And then I'll leave it here with Atomic Host because I know Mike's going to get more into this, but Atomic Host, as I mentioned, is uh, the um, optimized uh, Linux, container optimized Linux um, OS that we introduced last year as Red Hat Enterprise Linux Atomic Host. Um, and there's more work that we're doing as we continue to evolve that. And I think with that, I'm going to stop sharing um, and let Mike take over because I know he's going to be talking more about uh, Atomic Host and some of the other features we mentioned. So, uh, I want to go over some of the Atomic uh, uh, Atomic Host and OS Tree, and basically try to dig into what all this stuff is, and then touch a little bit on Atomic Enterprise Platform, as well as uh, OpenShift and how they all relate to each other a little bit deeper. I have some architectural uh, diagrams that I'll be going over as well which I think will help uh, uh, 
take some of the feature topics and the 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 the, uh, the slides that Joe went over and kind of dig them down into uh, something that you might use inside of your own in environment. So Atomic Host, uh, as Joe said, is our container opera optimized uh, operating system, and we have three flavors of it today uh, in Fedora, CentOS, uh, and RHEL. Uh, we're doing something new in Fedora with it, and it's kind of a fairly recent thing that this actually started happening, but we're releasing a new version of Atomic every two weeks. Uh, and so it's free. You can go and check that out right now uh, and download them. It's always got the latest and greatest Docker bits in it that we have, uh, and uh, you can always check it out there. Now, CentOS tends to be a little bit slower there uh, and tends to be still be rebuilt from the uh, uh, rel atomic host, uh, but it's also free. And, uh, and by slower, I mean it's not released as often. Uh, and then finally, you've got the uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux atomic host. And that one gets updated every six weeks or so. Uh, it's got a full release cycle, totally enterprise ready. Um, and so I think the first thing most people will realize when they look at these hosts, especially if you're familiar with Fedora or already a RHEL user, is how quickly we're updating these. You know, this is a very different model from what we've done in the past. And so uh, uh, it's you know very helpful for DevOpsies and uh, DevOps and uh, and developers who want the latest uh, and greatest either in Kubernetes or or Docker or whatever. Uh, we're really making strides to make sure that they have that in a supported and enterprise uh, friendly way. <clears throat> So uh, the first thing about uh, Atomic Host, if you haven't looked at it, is OS Tree. And it's the magic that makes Atomic uh, different from regular operating systems. So there's no yum in it, uh, and it changes how you do updates. Basically, if you have an Atomic Host, you have to run the Atomic command to do the updates. And so if you want to run, move from, say, version 721 to 722, you run Atomic Host update. And when you're done with that, uh, the system will still be on the previous version. You actually have to reboot to pick up the changes. Uh, significant portions of the op of the uh, file system are read-only, uh, and generally this allows you to think differently about your infrastructure and give you a better way to do updates, uh, and uh, especially in troubleshooting. You generally don't even have to try to fix a host uh, in some of these immutable situations. You can just uh, reboot or rebuild uh, and that is almost always going to be faster than trying to uh, to fix something. So keep that in mind. Uh, one of the other core components that goes into Atomic Host is Kubernetes. Uh, and uh, AEP, the Atomic Enterprise Platform, and OpenShift both rely on Kubernetes for their orchestration. Uh, and they do this across several nodes. Uh, just to give you another you know, view for those of you that aren't familiar, uh, it's got a full RESTful API. Uh, it's got some application templates built in, health checking. Uh, has a full self-healing uh, infrastructure, is totally extensible, and you will see how much we've extended it. Uh, and uh, there's also resource limitations that are, are built in, and scaling uh, is something that uh, uh, gets built in so you can easily add or move new containers. Uh, etcd is what we're using on the back end to store configuration and metadata. Uh, it's a basic key value pair, very simple to interact with. It's fast. Uh, it has consistency and resiliency built into it. And so if you if you haven't looked at etcd, it's, it's worth a, a view. Now, the core of everything that we're doing here in the container space is Docker. And uh, we, we rely on Docker for, the, for our imaging format. Uh, this is also what we're using today for our container namespace. Uh, it's also our distribution mechanism. Docker has this full layering uh, process built into it. And of course, the process control comes with it. So hopefully I don't have to go into this into too much detail. I do have a, a quick demo later for uh, for those that haven't really looked at Docker and, and just a quick way to get started using some of Red Hat's uh, technology. So Cockpit is something that is uh, gives a UI to individual atomic hosts. So if you have an atomic host and say you don't really know Linux or Unix that well, uh, you can still make use all of this stuff. Certainly there's a lot, a lot, a lot of developers out there who are building things in containers uh, on Windows machines and on uh, Mac machines. And maybe they don't even really know that much about Linux, but they do know they want to build things in containers uh, with the extensive container ecosystem that's out there. Well, you can still build all those things in containers uh, and you can still have a reasonably uh, functional and customizable Linux host using Cockpit without having to know any Unix at all, right? You can just use the UI uh, and I'll give a, a quick demo of some of that in a little bit. And of course, there's uh, the deployment. And so the, the basic steps, and this is kind of the important uh, distinction between 
uh, Atomic Enterprise Platform and, and OpenShift <clears throat> is that uh, in uh, Atomic Enterprise Platform, you have to create your container somehow, you push it to the uh, registry, and then you have to create an application manifest. And that application manifest then pulls down those existing images. And so the input uh, to an Atomic Enterprise Platform uh, setup is the manifests and containers. The flip side of that is OpenShift, which supports that exact same deployment scenario, but one it also allows for one additional input of source code, and that's that uh, S2I, the source to image uh, bits that Joe was talking about earlier. Once you're able to start providing source code, it completely changes the game for you in terms of being able to do, uh, uh, being able to have a fully end-to-end -end developed a workflow where developers can provide source code, it gets built and tested in the system and deployed to production, uh, and it provides that full DevOps experience, which is, I think, really great. So uh, the final component that we didn't talk about yet, which is uh, uh, the thing that makes uh, Atomic Enterprise Platform and OpenShift so great, uh, is Origin. Now, Origin is the upstream community process that integrates with Kubernetes and it extends a lot of those features of Kubernetes. And so for those of you that are wondering, well, hey, you know, I've, I've used Kubernetes uh, now for about a year. Uh, you know, I've, I've watched it when it came out about a year and a half ago and I really like it. Why would I use, you know, OpenShift or Atomic Enterprise Platform over, uh, over just a regular Kubernetes? And so uh, Origin is the answer to that. And it integrates very heavily with Kubernetes uh, and it leaves the the Kubernetes there. You know, the, the normal Kubernetes is still a part of all of this. It's just that we extend that Kubernetes functionality with a, a far more extensive user management and, and role-based access control system. Uh, we add the concepts of projects. Uh, Origin also allows us to add custom registry and router implementations. Uh, adds things like image streams, uh, and of course, uh, the, has a full template creation system, which is very important uh, in any sort of advanced application where you need to tie several containers together. Uh, you're going to need some way to uh, uh, to do that, and this template creation system uh, has the answer. So if you want to look at a basic architectural diagram, this is what it looks like. Uh, on the left here, you can see the OC person. That's the OC client tools, which come with uh, OpenShift uh, and Atomic Enterprise Platform. Uh, that is your primary interface to an Atomic Enterprise Platform uh, installation. And it connects to the Kubernetes uh, slash Atomic Master uh, that also has the Origin API. Uh, all this is RESTful and that's your interaction. And so once you send some job to the Kubernetes and Atomic Master, uh, the rest of it's handled by the system. It goes out to the Atomic node. It can deploy and pull down your containers as needed. Uh, it will you know, do whatever health checks you need. Uh, all you have to do is describe your application and the system will go and try to deploy uh, the containers as needed and keep them deployed. If something uh, fails on the back end, it will try to redeploy the containers, all of that stuff. Uh, one of the other nice things that we add at the uh, Atomic Enterprise uh, platform level is that uh, we have the Atomic Registry, which Joe talked a lot about a little bit. Uh, it, it can actually run inside of a container in the system, uh, as well as an HTTP-based router, uh, which we're looking to extend and make even better all the time. Uh, right now, it's based on HA proxy. Uh, in the next slide, you'll see uh, we have OpenShift, and it add, it takes all of that same core functionality and adds even more to it. And so uh, you'll notice that the user now has an option to use a UI to interact with Kubernetes and the Atomic Master, uh, in addition to the original OC tools. Uh, but it also adds the STI builder, uh, the Docker builder, which is very important if you need to rebuild uh, uh, images. So let's just say that you have no application change uh, to make, but maybe a shell shock happens or something in the underlying container uh, images needs to be built. Uh, the Docker builder uh, image can then rebuild those images automatically and deploy them uh, instead of having to go through and doing that manually. It also includes uh, some CI integrations that are great, uh, the Docker registry, uh, and it, it still has that same uh, HTTP router. So uh, first, I want to give look into a quick example of of you know what what these templates look like if you if you haven't seen them already. Uh, the first is an example from the upstream Kubernetes repo, and there's tons of examples up there already. Uh, I'm just going to pull down this one, which which includes several different uh, little containers that it deploys. The first is your basic hello world uh, template. And so if you look at this example, this is kind of your, your basic template example. 
and uh, I had word wrapped it before, but this actually will go through and, and uh, you can copy this into a file uh, and it has all the information uh, that uh, OpenShift or AAP needs in order to create this uh, application. Uh, the first, you know, just to give you a view of what some of this config file contains. Uh, first, when you deploy one of these things, you have to tell it what kind of, uh, of, of component you're deploying. In this, in this case, it's a, a pod component. Uh, the next is the name of the pod. You have to name it. And so ours is going to be Hello Atomic. And then you have to tell the image. Now these images are those Docker images. And this is the part of the deployment config that maps uh, the application desires to an actual container. And so, you know, in, in this case, that Hello Atomic container uh, already exists out in the uh, Docker Hub somewhere and it's ready for download. Next, you have to do some mappings. And so we know that this container internally listens on port 36061. And we want to expose that to uh, to people, uh, customers or whoever, on port 8080. And this is the mapping that does that. <clears throat> Finally, uh, in this example, we run the OC create command uh, that uh, pulls in that hello pod uh, JSON and it, just, it uh, sends that to the server via the REST API and creates the pod. It's very easy. Uh, once it's done downloading the, once it's done no, telling the node to download the image and start it, uh, you can then run an OC describe on it to let you know which IP address this is now listening on. And in this example, it got uh, posted to 10.1.0.2. If you remember from the earlier example, we exposed that port on port 8080, which means that we should have some sort of uh, application available on port 8080. And you can see that uh, by running the curl command, uh, you've got a 10.1.0.2 port 8080 uh, hello atomic uh, setup there. So uh, the next thing I want to show is uh, something that, you know, just a little teaser of something we've been working on, which is some of this visual boot stuff. And uh, the, the concept of this is just the quickest possible way to get started with Atomic. So let's just say that you happen to be at this commons. Maybe you saw it on Twitter. You're not really sure uh, what we're up to, or, or maybe even not really have used uh, Docker before, but you want to give it a try. Well, there's a virtual machine image that you can download on projectatomic.io, uh, and you can actually run that image. And that's what I'm going to do here. So I'm going to hit play. And uh, at the boot prompt, uh, if you're not familiar with Unix, there's a grub prompt. And you can kind of select what you want to boot into. Uh, and by default, it'll boot into uh, you know, Fedora 23 mode. And I'm sure that this is a little bit small. I apologize. I don't know that I can actually uh, make it much bigger. Let me see. Can I? Yeah, that should be better. So. Uh, in this uh, example, we also have this uh, sort of developer mode uh, boot option that we can do. And so we'll select developer mode. <clears throat> At this point, what's going to happen on the back end is Atomic is actually going to boot like normal. Uh, and then once it's done booting, it will automatically download uh, the cockpit uh, UI code from this Atomic host. And boot up. It will also generate a password and everything you need in order to get started. Uh, and it will actually show you some of this in the background. And so it's actually going out and trying to download the, the pod now, or I'm sorry, the uh, cockpit container now. And you can see that it's available at, uh, at the top there. Let me get my mouse here. At the top here, it's available at 192.168.122.24 on port 9090. Uh, and this is the root password that it has auto generated for us. So I'm going to uh, flip out of full screen because we don't actually need to do anything in that uh, container anymore at all. Uh, let me just uh, pull up that address. Twenty-two Okay. So as you can see, this is the the cockpit interface uh, that is booted in that virtual machine. I just need to log into it with the root address or root password that I've got. Now I can do all the things that you would commonly need to do on a Linux box without having to know the command line at all, without having to really know anything about Linux. Uh, you can provision storage, you can look at the logs, and you can even download it and install containers. And so if I want to, uh, in this case, I have previously downloaded the uh, JBoss Wildfly image, and I can actually start that container if I want. So this is the community uh, edition of, of JBoss. Um, we know that it listens internally on port 8080, and so I can actually tell it to start this container also on port 8080. 
uh, and I can run it, and it'll take a little bit to uh, to go and download and run. Uh, but once it's up, I can click, uh, see that everything's looking okay, and then I can actually bring that uh, image up all on my workstation and see that Wildfly is running. So uh, it's a really quick and easy way to get just looking at Docker. Uh, if you haven't uh, had a chance to to look at it yet and see what it's all about, uh, this is a really easy way to get started. Uh, and of course, that will take you down the rabbit hole of uh, always wanting more. And so, uh, you know, you can go take a look at the CDK options that we have as well for more serious development. Uh, you know, when you want to get out of the, I want to create a container mode and into the, I want to create an application mode. Uh, that CDK contains all of the build and developer tools that you would need, uh, as well as OpenShift. And uh, once we get the uh, OpenShift uh, online updated, you can also just go there and uh, test out and try whatever you want. And so I think I've got a couple more slides, and then I'll hand it back to uh, I'll hand it back to uh, Dan. So uh, in this case, we've got uh, one thing I did want to mention is that Atomic Enterprise Platform is not quite yet GA. We do have a public preview that's going on, and so if you have a TAM or an SA, feel free to talk to them, uh, or you can take a look at uh, access.redhat.com. Uh, uh, if you want something that, uh, you know, we release, you want to try it out directly from Red Hat. Uh, and there's also community versions of, of Origin and OpenShift available. So it's really easy to, to download and, and, and try these things. And so with that, uh, Dan, I'll hand it back to you. All right. Well, thank you very much, both you and Joe. And uh, Joe, uh, that was uh, a good introduction to the, the roadmap and the amazing amount of features that are getting put in for the next uh, couple of releases and that the atomic explanation was perfect there, Mike. So we only have one question. Um, Boris uh, posted something and I think that's more pointed towards Joe about, um, so since there is a finally push for online to move to V3, what is the likelihood of Red Hat releasing migration tools or at least documentation and what the strategy is for that? And I actually think that's a great topic for another OpenShift Commons session. Um, yeah. yeah, in terms of, so I'll talk to migration strategy first, right? So, so it is a it is a side by side migration from from uh, from OpenShift uh, OpenShift two to three. There's no upgrade in place, and the reason for that is because really everything changed from like the base operating system. Uh, OpenShift two is on RHEL six. In OpenShift 3, you're you're standing up either a RHEL 7 or a RHEL Atomic host cluster, and then things like the containers, um, the orchestration that we do with Kubernetes, these things are all new. What we try to keep consistent is the the services um, that are available. So so everything that you do in um, uh, everything that you do in um, in V2 in terms of like the the things we support like JBoss and Ruby and PHP and Python and Node.js, all of them have corresponding images um, in V3. Um, so, so we have the same set of images, um, actually more images in V3 than we had in V2. Um, for folks who created custom cartridges in V2 or customized our existing cartridges, that's a, essentially you're customizing the builder images. Um, we um, we have some examples of of how to build images and how to how to work with the assembly scripts, but essentially you know, the, the image is a Docker image. So you're, you're modifying the Docker file to, to change the base image and then, um, and then you know, uh, attaching the assembly scripts. Um, in terms of how we uh, do builds, Mike mentioned source to image. And then I talked about how we're working on um, binary to image uh, type enhancements. Um, that's the same way that you, know, you could push source code to a cartridge or push binaries through our binary build interface in v2 um, so so the goal is that like if you have an application uh, if you have a jboss a java application or a python application on v2 that it would just run in v3 the things that are going to um, require uh, changes is two things one is how you integrate the infrastructure so if you're tying if you're tying things like um, uh, the networking to your dns um, or using an external router uh, like an F5 or what have you, um, you know, th those that's going to be a different configuration. Hopefully, greatly simplified. Um, and then, and then anything that you did on sort of like hooks, like pre-deploy or post-deploy, if you if you added any any hooks, we have the same hooks in in V3 or similar hooks in V3. And yeah, that's certainly something that um, 
we'd like to work with users on and we'll certainly be working with a lot of users uh, as we migrate the online environment and providing examples on that. So, so, um, so I think, yeah, maybe doing a follow-up on this topic, Diane, uh, we'll, we'll talk about that as we, um, uh, so we can get into each of these areas so people can map what they're doing today to, um, so what they would need to do to get those apps to V3. So. I think there's, there's a lot of lessons learned at the OpenShift Online operations team. and Absolutely, yeah. You know, we, we can get that going. The, we're almost to the end of the hour, and um, so I, I think the other thing that I just want to point out, I tossed in the Trello um, link to the Atomic OpenShift Roadmap um, board, and if folks want to um, dive deep or look at where things are going or even perhaps um, contribute to some thoughts and feedback and code, um, to any of these areas that both um, Mike and Joe have talked about, this is a, a good place, a good starting point um, to take a look at a lot of these things. And like I said, there will be a uh, service catalog uh, session in February on the 11th. Um, we'll talk about that. We'll set up something around migration. I think that's a great topic. Um, next week, we're going to be doing a session with Blaze Meter on continuous testing. Um, so that should be very interesting as well. So we're trying to mix it up a little bit so that they're not all deep dives into roadmaps and technical stuff on the project, but also some of the services. So this has really um, been a great session for me. Uh, I, I know I've heard the roadmap explained a number of times, a number of ways, but this one actually worked quite nicely for me. So thank you both again for um, joining us today. And I, if you have questions, you can always jump on the IRC or toss them to us at um, OpenShift um, on the support at um, Stack Overflow. So just reach out um, and we'll be there and try and answer them. And we look forward to having you all again next week. So take care and thanks again, guys.